to the vibe. Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome to Web Science 2014. Welcome to Bloomington. And welcome to Indiana University. We'll take it. We'll take it. OK, so just a couple of quick notes. Uh, I'm Phil Menser. I'm one of the uh, co-chairs. And um, I wanted to remind you, uh, those of you who tweet about the conference, to please use this hashtag, hash websci14, so that uh, everybody can follow what's going on. And the only other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, after the keynote, we will have a, um, we will have a dinner a reception, and that will be in the Tudor room, which is on this floor, just getting out of this auditorium. Go right, and you'll find it. OK, so that's, that was just it for my announcements. And now I would like to introduce uh, the dean of the School of Informatics and Computing here at Indiana University, Bob Bishnabel. And I want you to thank him, because the school is the number one supporter of this conference, making it happen, not only financially, but also logistically, and helping us keeping the, uh, the registration fees as low as they are. So thank you, Bobby, and he will give us a quick welcome. Thanks, Phil. And this is going to be uh, quite brief. I thought you should, would, would be nice to just have a little welcome from the host institution. Um, host is a word that starts with H. There's a bunch of words that start with H that characterize what you're going to experience for the next two days. One that people always talk about in this area is Hoosier hospitality, and I suspect you will see a lot of that. Um, the Midwest and this area in general is known for that. The other one at this time of year is heat and humidity, and you will probably see a, a fair bit of that as well. Let me just tell you a tiny bit about this school, which is the uh, one of the hosts for this conference. The School of Informatics and Computing is one of the uh, five places in the U.S. among the major research universities, the AAU schools, of which there's six there's five that have had have whole schools of computing writ large, Carnegie Mellon, Cornell, Georgia Tech, Irvine, and Indiana. And what that means in probably all cases, and certainly ours, is three things. First of all, significant breadth. Uh, we have departments or units of computer science, informatics, and information and library science. Or thinking about it more conceptually, we go all the way from the foundational aspects of computing to a very broad set of applications, whether it's bioinformatics, health informatics, security, web science, as you're seeing here, many other things. And then quite a bit on the human and societal implications of computing as well. And we're really able to do justice to all of that. Um, part of what comes with being a school that large is size. This is a school of, three of two campuses, rather, uh, both Indianapolis and here. And between them, we have over 3,000 students and 150 or so faculty. So it's a large thing. About two-thirds of that is in Bloomington. And uh, finally, what hopefully comes with all of that is excellence in a number of areas as well. That breadth and size allows us to have really large groups in a number of areas, including cyber infrastructure and high performance computing, security, programming languages, bio and health informatics, human computer interaction, social informatics, and I purposely left to last complex networks and systems, which is not something one always finds in computing organizations in this country, but it's been at the foundation of this school since its inception, which is before my, my start here. We have a very large, strong, broad group in that area that we're very proud of, and that's the group that's the foundation of offering you this web science conference. So we're delighted to be your hosts. I don't want to take any more time away from our speaker, so I'm going to turn it over to Jim Hendler, who will get to introduce Wendy. Thank you. I was, um, Chris, Chris Welty was telling me I should start off with a soccer joke, but uh, we couldn't come up with a good one that the UK people would be okay with today, so <laughs> we're just going to let that go. Take care of it. You keep talking. Sorry. He's like, I'll take care of it. You keep talking. <laughs> no, but you need the mic. You need the mic. <laughs> we'll be sure. Sorry. We're a very professional organization here. We have everything running smooth. 
Um, you know, historians often look for the critical thinkers who've truly shaped the history of the various fields and technologies we use. So, you know, it's no, it, it's not really uh, hard to imagine the day when uh, the historians will talk about Vint Cerf as the father of the internet or Tim Berners-Lee as the father of the web. Of course, when they come looking for the father of web science, they're gonna have a problem because they've got the gender wrong. Because the person who's had the most influence, I think, to date on the creation and growth of the field of web science is our first speaker today. In fact, there's actually debate in some circles as to which of the W's in WWW stands for Wendy. Because Wendy has been an early pioneer of hypertext. Actually, her uh, microcosm system was known before the web. She's been the winner of more awards that we wouldn't have any time for her talk if I read them all. She's uh, consistently listed among Britain's most influential scientists. And uh, she was recognized by Queen Elizabeth in 2009 as, domain, as Dame Commander of, as Dame Commander of the British Empire. So it's my pleasure to introduce the parent of web science and a great friend, Professor Dame Wendy Hall. So I knew this would happen. <laughs> Sorry, thank you for that, Jim. Actually, no, I won't tell you what the students say. WWW, um, have, we, have we tried the detect displays? We, we, this is, we were having a problem before we started, and I, so, if, <laughs> please. Right, good. <sighs> right. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, now I can relax. I was a bit, right, thank you very much, Jim, for, the, um, uh, for that introduction. And it is, um, there were two problems. One, um, I didn't realise I was talking at 6 o'clock tonight. I thought I was talking tomorrow morning, despite the fact that it says I was talking at 6 o'clock tonight in the programme and that the itinerary my PA printed out for me said I was talking at 6 o'clock tonight. I hadn't registered this fact. Um, and, uh, but that does mean I can enjoy the rest of the conference, which is brilliant. And also, um, uh, it's... Um, it's, I was really pleased when uh, Phil asked me to do a keynote here because I hadn't actually talked at a web science conference and I think it was, I thought it was time, it's actually 10 years uh, to the, almost to the month when we started talking about web science um, and so I thought it was time to tell my version of the story. And also I want to tell you about... The title of my talk is Observing the Web. I want to talk to you about the Web Observatory. Um, so, let's get into it. I'm going to tell you the story. Now, of course, um, as Jim said, Tim will be known as the father of the web because he is. He, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, 25 years ago, March 1989, wrote this proposal that most everyone here will be familiar with. It's on the web, so we can now look at it on the web. And if you look carefully at it, you can see um, it talks about how he's going to build this hypertext system. It's uh, based on SGML, uh, well, the standard, the markup languages. It's a hypertext system and the internet org. Um, he brought those three worlds together in a way that nobody else had done previously uh, and then tirelessly promoted it. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide a bit. The, um, if you look at this, you can't read it on this slide, but down here is the semantic web. Right? So it, it wasn't just a document web. He, uh, from the very beginning, saw it as a web of data as well. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. So 25 years later, here we are. Um, this is a slide that uh, one of my now ex-PhD students, because he's got his PhD, Mark Schuler. Um, has been updating for me. I need to get the 2014 version in a few months. This is, um, I, can, I could talk to, I could do the whole talk around this slide. There are so many stories. This was a, um, a graph we put together, a set of graphs, when we were formulating the ideas about web science. And I thought, it's so important to look back. It's only, well, 
Tim, the, the, you know, Tim is talking about this year's the 25th anniversary of the web. Most people wouldn't have seen the web much before 2003-04. Um, and, you know, if you look at the graph, things that stand out, that stood out for me when we started to plot it, one is that Google didn't emerge until nearly 10 years after um, uh, Tim had uh, written up the first document about what he was going to build or what he was designing. Uh, which is quite amazing, because you think that Google's been around forever. We had search engines, of course. Um, but when you, those of you that can remember what it was like when the web was starting, there was nothing there. Um, I was given the privilege um, only a month or so ago, there's a gentleman called George Metakides, who's another important person in the story of the web. He was the person that helped negotiate the web move to the USA. Uh, Tim and Robert were at CERN, and uh, in, oh, well, that's Switzerland. Well, France is Switzerland. Anyway, it's not America. It's sort of in the middle of Europe, but not. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, they were trying to persuade the European Commission to adopt the web and web standards. This was um, 1994. The first web conference had happened. That was in um, May 94 here. Um, the first European web conference had happened, um, and the, uh, for the what was started off being called the Mosaic Conference but became the web conference was in Chicago in 90, October 94. And in between those two conferences, Tim moved to MIT, and George and uh, Michael de Tussos, MIT, helped negotiate this agreement that basically said, Sermon had already said they weren't going to charge anything for it, and, and the, but the European Commission weren't ready to adopt web standards. MIT was ready to give, had the funding to give Tim a chair, an endowed chair, and to set up um, what became W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. Anyway, there's a document that sort of enshrines that uh, negotiation. It's really weird because nobody owned the web then and nobody owns it now, but there's a document that was, there was an agreement um, that W3C would be set up effectively as a global standards body, having a footprint, a foot in America, a foot in um, Europe, in INRIA, and then also there was the, the foot in Japan, and it has grown from that. And in the document, it says, you know, it's that, this web thing is growing very quickly. Um, a couple of years ago, there were very few sites, and this year, 1994, there are 800 sites. And that was cited as an amazing thing. All right, there are 800 websites in 94. And that was the biggest hypertext it got in those days. Right, now, of course, there are billions. You can actually look it up on, uh, I think, I can't remember, you just type in how many websites and something tells you. There's, there's a counter, and it's getting close to the billion. And... Um, it's this phenomenal growth that we really track when we track the story of the web. How did it go from nothing to everything? Well, of course, partly that was because that's how Tim thought about it. It was his thesis that many people before him, including myself, hadn't got in the hypertext world, was that either everybody will use this, this thing or nobody will. Because... It's only going to become um, a global information network as... Um, predicted by people like Ted Nelson, who had a very different way of going to implement it, but this idea that we would have a global, interconnected, linked network of information based on the internet it would only scale, it would only grow if everybody in the world could use it, and that meant it had to be open and free. And that was Tim's thesis, was make it free so there's no barriers, no economic barriers, no uh, open standards, open source uh, code, so that everybody could get involved in this. Um, anybody could view a web, uh, get documents through the web through a browser that were, you know, um, initially were free, and then they, be, of course, became... The, we had the browser wars here. Um, and the, the story about it going... You know, Bill Gates saying this network's nothing to do with us and then changing his mind and Internet Explorer becomes part of the operating system and Netscape Navigator that was the original Mosaic browser disappears. But, 
But this was the, the thesis was every, everybody or nothing. Now, we've sort of achieved the everybody because there are no competing hypertext systems as far as I know. Um, uh, it doesn't mean it was the right one, actually, uh, but it, it, it achieved the objective that anybody could use it. But actually, um, I think we're still at about 30% of the world can access the internet at the moment. So 70% of the world yet to go. So we haven't achieved the, this is actually for everybody. And I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk, that there's a long way to go yet, and we could kill it before it's even really got off the ground. All right, so we think of it as totally ubiquitous and dominant, but it isn't yet. And it may never be in its current form. And that's one of the things we as a community have to worry about. Other stories in here. The dot-com boom and bubble bursting. Um, so this is the estimate of when it stopped and started that Mark has put on this visually using this circle. And Amazon started and people started in the mid-90s to try and buy and sell things or sell, uh, sell things on the internet. It's a bit like trying to sell books uh, you know, the first printers after the invention of the printing press is a bit slower than, in, than this revolution, but a revolution nonetheless, trying to sell books to a population that couldn't read. That was quite a hard thing to do. If you look at this world, the people who were trying to set up uh, retail on the, on the internet using web in the 90s, if you look at the technology, we didn't get Wi-Fi till the turn of the century and broadband just after that. I remember talking about this in the labs and thinking, oh, that sounds interesting. When you think about it, um, why was anyone going to uh, buy a computer to have at home? Do you remember how slow it was to get onto the web? We used to call it the, the other Ws, we used to call it the World Wide Wait. Because it was really so slow to get, a gra to get any graphics. It would whir and stop and time out. And there actually wasn't much on the web to look at. Um, and, I, you know, there was lots of, well, you, some people might fancy shopping on the internet, but actually most people are going to want to go to shops on the high street, in the malls. If you remember about the time, uh, this is where we need the social scientists, the demographers. But that was when the big... Um, it might have happened earlier in the States, but in Europe it was when the hypermarket started to really boom and everyone was driving out of town to go shopping. And that's where the retail community was. And there's the technologist saying, no, 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 you're going to buy it on the internet. They're going, whoa, come on, get over it. This, now look, 20 years later, and the, de I don't, the death of the high street and all the problems that um, uh, the... the um, I'm not saying that's a good thing, that, that the retailers have problems, but it's, it shows the speed... At, that once we get the technology, people find it very convenient to shop on the internet. So there's been, there have been several booms and bursts since this time. But if you look back at it from a technical point of view, it was obvious that bubble was going to burst. The companies were overpriced, overvalued. Everyone was trying to be Bill Gates. But actually the infrastructure to, to deliver that, that vision, that dream, just wasn't there. There, wasn't, um, in, there weren't enough people... Um, on, the, on the internet, at home, to do the shopping. Now it's a completely different story. Um, of course, the other thing is that we've moved from, at the very beginning, the web was read-only. And I can remember talking with Tim and others about this at a web hypertext conference, I suppose it was, and, and, and Tim was saying, well, people aren't going to use this if it's, it's read-only. Read -only. They'll want to be able to write so, of course, he was absolutely right with an R rather than a W. People did want to write to the web, but it was good enough at the beginning just to be able to read, just to be able to download a file by clicking uh, rather than having to type in an FTTP command. Um, it, that was good enough to be able to access files on the Internet for those of us that were able to do that in those days. Um, and the fact that we got an error 404, it didn't really matter because we could do something we hadn't done, we couldn't do before, and um, it, it sort of started to build up this momentum. We then needed, of course, search, decent search engines, not ones that were full of advertising or weren't accurate enough, and we all know the story of Google. Uh, that's an interesting story itself, but I'm, I could... See, I could talk for hours on this, and I need to get on to other things, but... Um, 
what actually then happened, of course, is the browser technology um, started to evolve and um, they became more interactive. They did enable people to write to the web without having to learn a markup language. And we have this for social network phenomenon. So Tim was absolutely right. People, he did predict people would want to write to the web, but it, it wasn't a necessary um, facility for us to start using it. Reading was enough to start with. Once we could write to the web, boy, did we write to the web. All right? And this is something that um, we look to the social scientists and people who are understand or try and understand human behavior is this, this need for people to expose themselves on the web to talk about every aspect of their lives. And, and now we're into the world of does privacy matter? All these questions of uh, and how do I know who I'm talking to? And, you know, it's the, this, is, this is the world of web science. Everything I've been talking about here is web science. This is the understanding of how this thing has evolved, but not just from the point of view of the technology, from the point of view of what people have done with that technology. And the idea there is this... Actually, I didn't include the diagram. We used to, in the early days, have a, uh, a circular diagram, which, you know, the idea that actually... As the technology evolved, people started to use it, so um, people started to write to the web, and then the applications would evolve to enable that to be more easily. So the first, first people started to put up web blogs, they, they, did the, they wrote the programs themselves, and then the application decided, oh, this is a good idea, let's create something to help people write blogs. Um, and uh, Twitter's is another example of where it starts off very simple, and then as we started to do things with it, the people who wrote the uh, produced the application Twitter had to evolve it to meet the needs that we were showing that we had. And of course, um, so um, let me carry on. Like I say, I could talk about that forever. We've now, uh, we now well know this. Uh, this is just 10 years, really, this phenomenon of Web 2.0. It's all very recent stuff in terms of civilization. Um, this is a blink of an eye, less than. But we're now into this world, and these names are very familiar to most people. Um, uh, even my 94-year-old mother has heard of them, even if she's never used them. She has, hears people talk about them. Um, and, uh, you know, we've all... But look at the... Because of the way Tim designed, did, did the design, there's effectively one of each of these. Not exactly. I mean, there was MySpace that evolved into Facebook, and there'll be many people that will study that and look at the growth of other social networks or, and the death of social networks. And, of course, in other cultures like China, you have the same phenomenon, but they're, because of the different laws and regulations in that country, they're different companies, but they have the Tencents and the, the Weibos and the Baidus. Um, you see the same thing, but there's like there's one place you put your photos and one place you put your videos. Because why are you going to put your photos where nobody else is putting them? Who's going to look at them? The whole point of this, which is, seems so obvious with hindsight, but didn't at the beginning, was that everyone was going to put, want to put all their family photos on the web and all their videos of their dogs doing silly things in the garden, right? You know, and millions of people look at them. Haven't they got better things to do with their lives? No, that's what they like to do, like playing Candy Crush. What level are you at? Anyway, um, <laughs> this, and, and people want, have, want to put their photos where everyone else is putting their photos so everyone else can see them. The same with the videos. So whilst there might have been different start, sites as things bubbled up, it eventually uh, all becomes one. And there's a math, of course, I'm not going to go into it, but there's a mathematics behind all this. To do, there's a network effect, that's what the, the web and the internet are based on, this whole concept of the network effect. If you look at the network science, then you understand that once something becomes a giant attractor, um, it attracts like a big black hole, it attracts everything else to it. And it's very hard for a new one of these to come up. So can we ever have a different type of microblogging site? Well, we won't have, a, I doubt we'll have another... Twitter, but we will have a, somebody will invent something else. There's a, I don't know, there's a yo thing going around, and I, I don't know what that means. Someone's going to have to explain this to me, but um, I want to get into it. But there's, so new things will emerge, but um, uh, generally speaking, there will be one big, one of them. And this, this really, so these two things really affect the economics of the web. 
One is that um, it's really hard to get something started on the web because you really have to give it away for free. Right, if you start by trying to charge something, I mean, obviously, if you're trying to sell things, you, you, have, you charge for what you're selling, but you don't charge for access, like you no know, shop charges you to go in, generally. But things like um, you know, Google and Facebook and Twitter, they all had to start for free, and then they have to monetize. And we all know the story of the share prices and um, the things that uh, uh, they have to do as companies to, to then... Um, uh, please the shareholders. And really, of course, but I'm not an economist, but um, it, what people are buying when they buy those shares is that those companies have vast numbers of customers, users. It's that network that you're really buying. Um, and Google's a very interesting company. People talk um, often about these you know, monopolies and should they be broken down? Of course, this is another issue about... Well, what would happen if you tried to break up Google, um, uh, uh, thinking of it as a monopoly? It's, well, I would, my thesis would be if you tamper with the search engine, it's lost. It would, you can't, how can you break up a search engine? How could you? And we'll come back to that at the end, well, but briefly. The issues of, um, the whole issues of net neutrality and, uh, uh, you know, the, bi the big issues that make this whole thing stick together. But... Um, do, should Google be, have the monopoly on automated cars? Well, that's a different kettle of fish. I think Google's a very clever company doing amazing things and uh, knows an awful lot about us. So there's very, very... The issues we look at are very different to the issues we used to look at when people were talking about the Microsoft and the um, HP and uh, IBM monopolies and, and monopolies in other sectors of industry. This is a whole different world. And this is the world that we as web scientists need to study. Um, I don't have to go, when I give these talks, this is my village in Hampshire, and my husband was chair of the parish council, and he wanted to spend some money on the... Parish is the smallest... It's not the church, it's the village, but it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, he wanted to spend a bit of money on the website, and the council voted against it as being a uh, waste of public money. And then I gave a talk in the village hall... Uh, this year and showed them that somebody, you know, we are actually on the web, the village is on the web, somebody has taken the time to write about our village that did exist in the Doomsday Book and now we exist in Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an amazing phenomenon. It's very fragile. Um, there's a whole governance thing in Wikipedia. Again, that's a, 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 you could do a whole lecture on that, that you set in one as one thing. And that is becoming quite fragile. There are less people writing to Wikipedia because they're being told they can't put their sites up because some unknown, you know, a faceless person is saying, I don't think that's important enough for you to put up. Who has the rights to do that? Uh, it's, it's evolving. Um, and and this, this is the sort of thing that web scientists need to study because this is such a new phenomenon. Um, there are thresholds by which you can... I'm sure we can work out um, a thesis by which you can tell that something is going to die. Now, I hope Wikipedia isn't at that point yet. But as scientists, we need to evolve a, a theory that, that tells people, whether it's a company or something that is owned by the people, like Wikipedia, that it's on the verge of something b bad happening. Unless you change what you're doing, this is going to go wrong. Or, you know, and, and these, this is what I think web scientists... This is, this is why web science is so important. Because can we just leave this to trust that it's going to be OK? You know, we, we really need to provide the evidence and the, and the understanding of how these networks grow, how they evolve, and what can kill them, what can make them be good for, good for the world... What, and, and there's so many different issues here, uh, which is why it's so fascinating and so difficult at the same time. Twitter's um, another story you can, you can tell lots of stories about. This is an old slide I've got, which tells the beginning of the story of Twitter. We're all into analysing um, lots of Twitter data because it's public data and because we can get at some of it or all of it. And we're often accused of Twitterology, but there's wonderful things, the whole of, you know, not the whole of, was a point Nosh made in the uh, talk this morning that's like, 
a tiny, tiny fraction of the world's population uses Twitter. So when you analyse Twitter data, you aren't reflecting society, but you are saying interesting things about the people who use the, use the internet. And this is, a, um, I've put on here, uh, this is, I haven't updated this, this was a, just a snapshot at the time to show that, you know, this started at the South by Southwest conference on mobile phones, it moved to the web, it went on the BBC programme that tracks technology. Um, it must have got important because Nigel Shabbolt went on to it around here, and I'm sure some of you in this room did. I'm not an early adopter. I didn't go on till here, you see. Um, but this, in the UK, there's a... You, Stephen Fry is a famous comedian, and he's a gadget. He's an early adopter of everything. And in um, the summer of 2008, when everything's quiet and people are on holiday, he famously tweeted from a lift, an elevator, sorry, that he was stuck in this elevator. And the press picked this up. It was a big story in the UK. And suddenly everyone looks at Twitter. But of course, what had happened... What, of course, I say of course. In retrospect, what had happened was he just... I mean, I checked this with him when I met him. Um, and uh, uh, he, he gets involved with the web world a lot, so it's, it's easy to, to get hold, to talk to him. And he, um, he had just picked up his iPhone 3G when he sent that tweet to say he was stuck in the elevator. This was a step change in technology. We now have lots of mobile phones, 3G, 4G, 5G, down, down the line. This is one of the things that enabled Twitter to take off, because you could tweet on the move. And of course, then you get the, the famous things that we remember, the Mumbai attacks, first Obama election, the miracle on the Hudson, the Australian bushfires. And these were you know, various things that happened that, um, make Twitter suddenly, instead of people telling each other what they have for breakfast, it saves lives, it's a, the celebrity cult, it's, well, we know, all know what it is and we hope you're all tweeting today. And things like YouTube, I've already talked about how we all wanted to put our videos up. Now, YouTube, of course, a certain big company has bought YouTube and it's changing. I mean, this is the other thing, is that these companies gobble up the smaller ones, the smaller social networks that appear because well, it's like the new economics. They need those people, they need that network, and they also see them as potential competition, and they want that, you know, so Google wanted the ability to have the video social network, and this is changing entertainment. It's changing the whole way we get entertainment and um, uh, changing broadcast entertainment and so many different things, but... Uh, the, big, the big parent company is changing how this works. And it's very interesting to think whether a new, I don't know what it would be called, you know, open video thing will grow up alongside one that is commercially owned. I, I personally think we will see this because we know what we had. And the, I'm talking about we as the, you know, the so society. Right? We knew what we had with YouTube. If it changes, are we going to be happy and satisfied with that? Or are we going to yearn enough for what we had before, which was more open and anarchic? I mean, this is the... You know, the web started out as complete anarchy, in a way. The only not-anarchy piece of it was that the you signed up to the a, a set of standards and protocols that were published by W3C. And that's what means you can all, you know, use it the same. Whatever your country or culture or language, the technology is the same at the moment. Um, that's one of the reasons it works. But um, where was I going with that thought? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I think that um, it will be very interesting to see. I always think when I say this about the campaign for real ale in the UK, which, uh, <laughs> you know, we had a terrible period in the UK with beer, when it all got very gassy and horrible and, and the company you know, it was just mass-produced rubbish and there was a campaign for real ale and we get back some of the real ale. And this is the sort of... I think we'll see this happening on the web. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good analogy, but here we go. So, um, now, so that's the world of the doc link documents and social networks. And then, of course, as I said right back at the beginning, part of Tim's vision was the... The, what he called the semantic web, and I remember him talking about this in... Uh, well, he talked about it at the first web conference. I, d I can't remember that. Um, 
Uh, but if you look back at the transcript of what he said at the first web conference, he is absolutely right. He did talk about it at the first web conference in 94. And then everyone got very busy trying to push the, the document web and keep it simple so that it, we, it, you know, we persuaded people to start to use it. And it started taking off and Google emerged. And around about the time of the Australian web conference, I think it, that, was, that, was the, that was the conference that the Google paper was published in, was 98 or 97? 8, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a PhD. <laughs> We've got one. So, um, um, he, uh, Tim, I remember the keynote, Tim saying, now, okay, we've got the document web, we're sort of sorted, now we've got to get to concentrate on the data web. He called it the semantic web. This got the artificial intelligence community um, interested. I'm not going to be too rude to Jim tonight, um, because Jim has worked tirelessly to get the semantic web and the web of lick data adopted. But it did for a while go very theoretical. And um, uh, uh, we were all working to, uh, it went sort of behind, you know, this was the, um, that uh, Jim had a lot of involvement with, this was the roadmap that was um, published around the turn of the century that um, uh, we all were working to. Um, and it got very sort of bogged down in um, ontology discussions and debates, and RDF was accepted as standard. And, but that was the sort of language people are talking in. You know, most people outside the semantic web community, let alone out in the, in the public and the media, had no clue what this was about. If you started... I mean, I can remember trying to explain to people what the web was before the web existed. That was really hard. You can't imagine that now because it's there and nobody knows life... Well, very few people think of life... It's very hard to think of life before it. And it was the same trying to tell people about the semantic web. You know, what is the point of this? Why, you know, why do I need to bother to print my data in... Put my data in RDF and think, you know, write an ontology which people tell me is very hard? What's the benefit? Well, the benefit is just like the first web. If we all do it and link the data together, amazing things will happen. But until people start doing that and you see the amazing things happening, nobody wants to do it. And you've got that real problem of persuading people there is a nirvana out there, and if you just get started, it will all unfold. Um, I was saying at the Web Observatory workshop this morning, um, I'll come, I'm going to come on to the observatory now, but the trying to persuade people to put their data into an observatory so other people can share it. They say, why should I bother to do that? I can just publish it on the web. You know, I've got my own tools to do that. Well, it was just like with the first web. I can remember going around, talking to industry about, you need to put your documents into this standard system and you can share it with people. And they say, well, I've got Documentum. We've got our own customised version of whatever. Why do I need to move my documents into another format? And, you know, nowadays nobody would ever think about not doing it unless it was, it's very secret stuff. And even then they use the same standards. They just, you can't see the documents. And uh, it's that, uh, how do you get to that tipping point where pe you start to notice other people doing it, so you start doing it, me too, and then you get to the, um, the viral thing. And we weren't getting there with the semantic web. And... Um, it was 2004, the New York Web Conference, when Tim started talking to, um, to me about how um, the semantic web wasn't taking off. And, and you know, Southampton, uh, with um, Nigel, Nigel Shabbat had come to Southampton by then, and we were doing this work on the semantic web. And could we help and promote and, and you know, get the idea of the semantic web out to the world? One of the things we did was write this paper which said, actually, it's really very simple at one point. But the other thing we did was to, with Danny Weitzner and with Jim, start to think about um, why wasn't this world emerging? And we look back at why, why the web, how the web had evolved, and that's how web science came about. I've got a slide in here which doesn't really fit, but, um, you know, we're now into this age of... You know, having told this, just finishing the story of the semantic web as it is now, it's often called the silent revolution because it is happening. It's happening behind the scenes and lots of companies and there's new companies emerging are using this technology and seeing the benefits of linking data either in, within an organisation or across organisations. 
and it's changing the way that we think about data and we, the way that we build um, databases, um, repositories of data. It's led to and um, enables the world of open data um, and big data. And we're into the data age. We get we and the web enables us to generate that data and helps us to look at the data. Um, so it's the, a rather incestuous relationship, uh, but. Um, at least we're beginning, people are beginning to see behind the scenes the power of the semantic web in building more intelligent applications. So, back to the story of web science and the web observatory. We, in a very, in a nutshell, um, we began to think about, we spent many hours in pubs and clubs, no, not clubs, I'm too old by then, but pubs, um, thinking about, no dancing, oh, some karaoke. Um, but um, about the web, um, not just from the point of view of technology. I mean, Dan, uh, Tim, Nigel, myself, and Jim, of course, are all com computer uh, people. Danny is a lawyer um, working with Tim at MIT. But we realized that actually we had to start engaging with the people who understood human behavior, how society works. Um, how organizations work in order to understand this new phenomena which we as had co-constituted this uh, micro, this um, uh, socio-technical system uh, that the web is it's uh, it's not the, the because of the technology it, it grows it's because of what we do with it it's what we put onto the web that makes it grow and if, if you can't encourage people to put the stuff onto the web, or if we stopped putting stuff onto the web, it would stop growing. Uh, so we launched the Web Science Trust in 2000, and, sorry, we launched the Web Science Research Initiative at MIT in 2006, and it was a bit like jumping off a cliff without wings. You know, it was like, yeah, okay, well, you know, everyone's heard of Tim, and people have heard of Nigel and I, but who are we to say that, and Danny and Jim, but who are we to say that there is a new s s discipline here? Did, was anyone going to listen? There were lots of people doing social network analysis. Was that enough? We believed, it, we thought it was something more than that, that we had, that there was a, there was a whole new um, issue here, of a scientific um, discipline that needed to evolve, um, that wasn't just a here today, gone tomorrow, that was going to have a profound effect on the world of science and the world in general. I, was, I keep that quote up from, from Eric Schmidt because it's a nice quote. That was when the press release went out from MIT about you know, Tim Berners-Lee's thinking of this new thing. We called it web science. I always say there's two things I don't like about that name. One is web and the other is science. But we sort of um, stuck with it now. Anyway, uh, we then, people did like what we were saying and were interested and... Um, we took uh, three years to create the, um, a not-for-profit web science trust, which took it out of the two universities, Southampton and MIT, and, and with RPI as a, um, involved as another partner, and it out into the world. Um, we describe it, uh, described it as a very interdisciplinary idea, a bit like an analogy would be with environmental science which has, over the last 30 or 40 years, evolved into something that people study at university, but was a coming together of lots of different sciences to try and understand the environment. And this is the same thing. There are things missing from there. Um, philosophy, is that there? Education should be there. There's many things that are not on that map, but it's the idea that, as I think Jim said this, it's not all of those things. You don't have to understand all of it, but it's certainly more than the intersection, the very tiny intersection. Um, so anyone, to me, if you're not doing something interdisciplinary at this stage, you're not doing web science, which is one of the driving forces for this conference. We didn't want this to be a conference of just computer scientists or just of social scientists. We wanted a coming together, and that's really, really hard to get computer scientists, social scientists, political scientists, economists, lawyers, all to come to the same conference. We don't get it right yet, and we need the community to help us. And we also want other people to take, take this out to your home conferences as well. Um, but the essence of it is an interdisciplinary idea, and we've been organising these conferences now for one, two, three, six years. We have one, two, what's this, the sixth? <laughs> I 
um, uh, became an ACM conference. And um, we have a network of laboratories that we um, that we that we that help us that have you know help the trust if, um, coordinate uh, web science work and um, and get the ideas out to the world. And in fact, uh, we. People don't always understand. There is a there's a publication, Foundations and Trends in Web Science, which we didn't start as a research publication because we didn't think the world was ready for the research, because we didn't know what it was when we started. This is a this is a mono a monograph publication. It's a, they're little mini books, but uh, this year. The publishers of the, of the Foundations and Trends, who have been regularly to the conference, they're not here this year, but they often come, um, the now publishers, have um, on the back of the success of their Foundations and Trends series, not just web science, they have a whole set of them, not just in computer science either, um, they have uh, launched a totally open access journal that Wolfgang Nadel is the editor of and Richard Rogers is the associate editor-in-chief. And this is launching first issue. Wolfgang's going to talk more about this um, later in the conference. Um, the call, call for papers is out. It's here. This is a research journal. And it's totally open access, supported by now. Um, so it's free to publish and free to read. Um, and I think that's a tremendous uh, step forward for the community. Um, it says I've been talking for 37 minutes. Is that right? Did we start very late? I don't know. Anyway, have I got a bit more time? because I haven't got to observatories yet, and I know I started late, so I'm claiming an extra. Um, so this, we, anyway, I, uh, let me get on to observatories. Um, this is the, uh, we've just been launching our Web Science Institute at Southampton. This is a bit of self-publicity. We have our wonderful, doctor, our wonderful students in our doctoral training centre. This is a Web Science PhD programme. What I like about it, for someone who's used to walking into a computer science classroom and seeing a lot of guys, there's a very mixed, diverse, um, as is this audience, which is fantastic. Um, because, uh, yeah, um, women use the web as much as men, and it's really, really important that the study of that is, comes from all perspectives. Uh, we've got a WOOT, we've published, done a MOOC this year, which is a very interesting thing to do. And we also have this project, which is as I'm, I'm going to use this to lead up to the observatory bit, which is um, something that... Um, we have a project at Southampton, a big, big research project, so many millions of pounds, which we do with Oxford and uh, Edinburgh. Um, the web is a social machine, which we're using to formulate some ideas about how social machines evolve on the web, or don't, or die, or whatever they do. And this is something that comes from Tim's idea, and actually talking to our social science friends about the fact that the web is socio-technical. It's co-constituted by technologists and machines that we program and what people do. with. Um, and it's the two things coming together. It's that network of machines and network of people. And Tim talked about this in his book, Weaving the Web. And he coined the phrase there, the social machine. It can be called lots... They can be called different things. But here he talks about um, uh, computers... Um, helping create the abstract social machines on the web processes in which people do the creativity and the machine does the administration, which rather oversimplifies it, but it's the, he says, the stage is set for an evolutionary growth of new social engines. Well, if you, if you take that idea, then everything on the web um, is a social machine, the web itself, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, um, the Louis Van Arn stuff, which... Uh, TripAdvisor, I've just put some examples here of things, um, the, the citizen science stuff like Ga Galaxy Zoo or Shahidi, um, the way the open street map thing works, Amazon, even, they're all examples. They've become commercial companies, many of them, but they are examples of social machines. They evolve because you do something in this environment, um, you know, the, pro the machines are programmed to do something like Twitter, we, we, the micro, micro blog was defined, very simple. We've done some, we, the people, have done something with that and made it into something that couldn't have existed if the two systems hadn't come together in a way that we don't understand. And I haven't put the words in here, but in fact, the, um, the title of the grant is uh, The Social Machines, The Theory and Practice, Web Science, sorry, um, the, the Theory and Practice of Social Machines. Um, and... Uh, 
this is, I, get, this is um, I think Dave DeRule wrote this first, this slide first, the idea that um, if you, you start with conventional computation, if you add more computers, you get into the big data, big compute world, add more people, you get into social networking, where they come together, that's where the social machine world works, uh, arrives, and that's our world of web science. So, let me say that again. Um, web science, the theory and practice of social machines. Oh, yeah, I had put the words in here. Yeah, this is the um, uh, slide from Nigel uh, talking about the, the title of our project with Oxford and Edinburgh. The key thing about social machines is they're not Turing machines. If you could, if you, uh, my argument is if you can do it with a Turing machine, then it's not a social machine. It's, some of the crowdsourcing stuff, the Mechanical Turk stuff, is just that the Turing machines aren't big enough or clever enough to do it. Um, we've had a lot of debate about whether... Galaxy Zoo is a social machine, and clearly um, this sort of citizen science stuff does evolve into social machines in its own right. But initially, getting people to identify galaxies um, potentially is something that machines will be able to do down the line. But what becomes a social machine is when people start developing a social uh, context around developing galaxies and identifying galaxies and start creating a whole world of galaxy identifiers. And we're, they're seeing that emerge at Oxford and the, and the Galaxy Zoo project, which is now called Zooniverse. Um, and um, uh, I, also, I also say that if, if I now think of um, web science as a theory and practice of social machines, then I now know how to define computer science. It's a theory and practice of Turing machines. Think about it. So, one of the things when we were starting to think about web science in this way was how were we going to study these types of machines? What could we do to actually monitor, observe how they grew, uh, and what, as things, as parameters change, conditions change, they evolved? So we started, um, I think I got this idea first at Davos, uh, when I saw how, when you get um, the idea that if you gather the evidence, you can influence policy makers, all right? Because Davos is effectively a collect... I was very lucky to go there one year, and Davos is effectively a collection of very influential people. And you, they meet on this, the top of a mountain every January, and then they go away and talk about the things they've heard there. And it's a way of amplifying good ideas. And I thought, well, we, if we could do this for the web, how do other communities do it? So we started talking about this idea of the web observatory. And rather than get you to read that long slide, I'll start you with the... Um, uh, you can read this IEEE paper that uh, Thanasis, myself, Nigel, Dave, Nosha and Jim uh, wrote now a couple of... Oh, yes, a year ago. Um, but the idea was very much that as the, just as the physicists, who are very, very good, by the way, at getting money to do big things, um, have evolved over time this collaboratively, collaborative way of studying the, the, the heavens. Right? They persuade people to give them lots of money to buy telescopes. They put them in beautiful places in the world. Oh, sorry, I'm joking. They put them where they can, you know, the telescopes get the best um, uh, view of uh, what's happening. And they, they, they take those amazing images that we all see all over the place. Then they gather that information and they analyze it and they share it. We have telescopes all around the world and there's a virtual organization that manages the sharing of that data so that we get a map of the heavens and we start to you know, see the experiments that can be run. And that helps influence the policy makers to give them more money. And another um, example of a community that really has to do this and that has evolved over some time is the community, the environmental science or the climate science community. Um, if you think about... I, I was... Um, I've been involved in the Longitude Prize. Um, no, that wasn't what I was thinking. I have been involved in the Longitude Prize in the UK, but we were thinking, oh, D-Day, that's right. We were, we were celebra celebrating, we were commemorating D-Day, uh, 60 years, wasn't it, this year, um, at the beginning of this month. And the uh, weather on the, on the BBC, they were talking about how in 1944, 
you couldn't predict the weather more than about 12 hours ahead, and even then it wasn't very accurate. Can you imagine that? Imagine not knowing what weather's... Well, how would I know what to pack? <laughs> you know, it's like... And that, uh, that science has evolved hugely with the use of technology, the whole science of meteorology. Um, and, it, you know, when you th also think about how this evolved with a lot of amateur meteorologists taking the temperature in, that back, in their backyard, their back garden, every day, collecting that information and sending it to somewhere, um, people collecting rain in buckets to show how much rain had fallen, people go out and measure the glaciers. This is the world of meteorology. And as we all know, that's evolved into a world that really hits the headlines because of the what's the impact we're having on the physical planet uh, with what we're doing with technology, what impact is that having on the climate? And the only way you can really have any answer to that is to collect the evidence day in, day out, uh, year after year after year, and then have bodies of scientists store that data, analyse that data, share the results, um, and you have to trust what they're doing. And I, there's a lot of debate about trust of um, what people, the, the data people are producing, how they analyse that data. But this work is so, so, so important to help the politicians and help the big companies. You know, there's a three, with these sorts of um, uh, big challenges, you've got governments and, you know, the national uh, countries involved. Um, you've got the big companies who are putting pressure on those governments to buy their technology, be they wind farms or... Um, people who run the power stations. Um, and then you've got us as citizens. And our behaviour en masse hugely will affect what happens. Right? Um, we could, you know, there's so many different ways you can go in this, and we all know that this debate is going to run and run. But the crucial thing is for the scientists to gather the evidence so that you're not hypothesising, but you're saying... If we don't do this, this will happen. Or if we do do this, this might not happen. Um, or we just give up and build a spaceship to take us to another planet, or something like that. So, um, of course, it's probably the flu that's going to wipe us out anyway. But that's another whole story. It's another whole set of data to be gathered. So it's this idea that I want to spend another five, ten minutes talking about before you go and have your wine. This idea of, can we do this in our community? Can we actually, there are people all around the world, um, people like you, who are gathering data, harvesting off the web, doing projects with whatever company, with the government, with your public sector open data, analysing that data, writing analytical tools, doing a lovely visualisation, and then you get your PhD, and off you go, and it all disappears. All right, and someone else has to reinvent that whole wheel, Nothing's joined up. There's nowhere to say, that, oh, well, I've got this data. Do you want to repeat this experiment in your world? There's a lovely talk today by um, the lady from UCI. I'm sure she's here somewhere. Talking about something they've done in San Francisco to do with um, people, um, uh, how the um, pollution may affect um, people getting cancer and uh, picking up on people tweeting about this sort of thing. And that project, which has been focused in... Uh, San Francisco could be repeated all around the world and we could uh, have a huge amount of evidence uh, if we can adopt these types of principles. So this is my plea to you. This is, um, let me just explain a bit more about what we're trying to do. This isn't all about open data, by the way. That's out of date. We've had uh, the next one in LA in March and we're planning a summit in 2015, not 2014. Should have changed that. But... Um, this is what, this is um, the NASA's slide, which um, people are beginning to use. Um, it's us, we're training our telescopes on the web. This is not about surveillance. This is not Big Brother. We're not trying to see what you do and you do and you do. We're trying to see what we do en masse, on scale, and what effect that has on this ecosystem that we have evolved. No one else owns it, we own it. There's no company that owns it. There's no government that owns it at the moment. No, neither of those. We need to keep it that way, possibly. And um, we're talking about observation and experiment. 
So in the web observatory, and the web observatory, of course, will be a collection of observatories. We tend to talk about the web observatory. It will be a collection of, it's not one big place we're going to put, there's not one place we're going to put all the data. This is about, think of the amateur meteorologist. This is about collecting data in your region, uh, working with um, the companies, and I'll, I'll come back to um, working with the big companies who have lots of data, of course, in a minute, um, and sharing this data sets, the way of interacting with the data sets and the analytics um, in a decentralized way, in a very web way. Right? This is not about central control. Um, and <clears throat> now, this is the, a really important slide about levels of sharing, because the easy pickings, the easy fruits, the open data sets, that's public. And of course, Twitter, if we can get hold of the data, uh, there's lots of complications about using Twitter um, but, and how you get hold of it. But, I mean, at least it's public data compared to the Facebook data or the Google data or the Amazon data. And, and uh, that's where a lot of the data is. But the easy pickings, we can start at the open data sets. Um, and then you have the data that's shareable but not necessarily open. People will let you play with it as long as you don't make it open to the world. And then you have the, the world of very private data, which may be uh, government secure data, or it may be data that's got personal data in it, like health data or the data in Facebook or um, uh, Amazon or whatever, um, that needs to be protected, but we still need to be able to access it. So we need to build an environment where there are safe harbours or havens, whatever you want to call them, where people can combine open and closed data sets in a world where there you sign up to terms and conditions about how you do that and you publish your results but not the core, the com, the core data. And you, you would share the analytical tools to use that. So it's about finding a way as a community to list and describe data sets and the archives. So there's a lot of uh, links with the Internet Archive people here of activity on the web. Uh, sharing the analytics and the visualization so we don't all have to reinvent those wheels. Harmonization, standards are so important. This is how the web works, this is like how open access came about, how the semantic web works. There's a W3C community group we've started in this area because it's all actually about agreeing to publish data in common standards uh, so that other people can share it. And uh, the analytical tools are actually even harder. So support for analytics on a global distributed scale and the provision of safe harbours. So there's, um, you know, there's all the different ways we might store it in the cloud, there's the internet archives, there's um, social media, there's lots of different places we're going to get the, the web itself, get our data. We've got to catalogue that, we've got to provide a way of cataloguing it. Um, we've got to uh, create the standards piece um, and then we've got to let other people use it. I mean, the wonderful thing, when I had an eye-opener about this was when we were doing some work in China with our Chinese colleagues at Xinhua. And um, some social scientists were able to take what the students had done and analyse the data without having to understand anything about how the code was written and, and come up with... I've got an example in a minute of what they did to do with salt and humour on the web just an amazing eye-opener of what can be done. It's so important that people can access this who are not computer scientists. Um, this is a slide from Dave DeRaw. Um, and uh, this, is what, this is one of the things that is so important about this work. We took, uh, I don't, the number of R words here is growing all the time. I started out talking about we want the research to be repeatable and reproducible and re the data to be reusable. And Dave's growing this. This is a, a photo of the slide that he put out on Twitter. Of all the things that other science communities can do, we need to learn how to do this. Right? And actually, the most important thing, and I'm just going to, in a minute, finish with a couple of um, examples from our web observatory, is the most important thing about this, is you'll say to yourself, well, where is it? Where does it exist today? Why should I bother to do that? Just as people did in 1992, they said, well, what is this web thing? I can't see it. What's it going to do for me? Why should I bother to put my documents on the web? I hope I've given you a reason as to why you should bother to do this and not say, oh, well, I, you know, okay, I can put my own catalogue up. It's all about sharing and, and linking and... and um, 
combining data sets so that we get um, a, a richer result. Um, we have uh, our own instance at Southampton of a web observatory. We're building one and um, we're building on standard stuff to create um, an instance. There will be many of them and other, different people, just like you don't, there's not one type of telescope. There's a, an industry in selling telescopes to physicists and they are often customised. Um, they cost a lot, they're not free, but, um, you know, th there is a world of a market in telescopes, and I think there'll be a market in web observatories. They won't be as expensive as telescopes, but, um, you know, not everyone will want the same sort of thing. This is the one we're building. It's really important you have somewhere to... St your, your observatory, your telescope has to have a way of storing the data. You've got to have a way of making your yeah, analytical tools... Of course, you've got to analyse the data. You've got a way of making that available... And then you've got to have easy ways to look at that data so that non-technical people can use it and make sense of it in their context, whether they're social scientists or economists or lawyers. And we need those other disciplines to put the results back into the observatories. Uh, so that's the sort of architecture that we're working on at the moment. Um, these are slides from Thanasis about how it's all going to link together. You don't need to read this, but the components of a portal, the components of a data store, and um, the tools that we're going to make available um, for other people to use. And not everyone's going to be an observatory. Most people are going to look at the results of observatory. And the portal really actually is really what, you know, the physicists have the telescopes, they take the pictures, but Anyone can look at the pictures. They make those available. That's the sort of analogy here for web science. And then the idea is they'll all link up. Now, these might not all be Southampton architecture ones, but the idea is they all link up at the portal level. And um, there are you know, people who provide web observatories, be people who can write code, and then there'll be web observatory curators who will put the data in, look after it, help people analyse it. Make, I mean, there's going to be all sorts of issues here about um, insurance issues, about what are you doing with private data. Um, so this is sort of like the world of libraries and, and internet archives. There's a real link here to people who care about data, can, can arrange, make arrangements with the companies in order to use the data that they own in a... In a, in a um, a way that keeps that data private or secure, if that's what it is, and, and helps people use the analytical tools. So there are, all sorts of, there are all sorts of roles here. This is not an easy world, but it's just as with the web. You have to start somewhere. Um, just put your data out there in an agreed... F oh, oh, this is a nice... Um, this is it all linking up. These are examples at the moment that we've got. Um, our one, um, the one at RPI. There's an internet science one now. Uh, there's one in Bangalore we set up, there's the one at UCI, there's one here at uh, Indiana. And they, the idea is they all link up. And then there's a catalogue of these, which the Web Science Trust is uh, volunteering to, to manage. Um, here's an example of... Um, so if you look in our web observatory, will this work from here? No, it doesn't. Oh, yes, it does, right. Um, just a brief, it, doesn't, it won't take one minute... This is the sort of thing you see, the data that's in our observatory and um, Wikipedia data, DVpedia data, Chinese data from Sina Weibo, Twitter data, Wiki, um, Zooniverse data. You can all access that data, right? You can use it. There's all issues about how you cite that. Who, you know, because there's all the issues that other communities have about our oceanographers say cost us a fortune to get that data. You need to cite us if you're going to use it. We have to work that out as a community. And then in the visualisations, here's um, this example is the, the one that came out in China where the, um, they were looking at the, how humour emerged around the crisis they had that salt... Uh, they thought salt would protect them from the nuclear radi radiation fallout from the Fukushima accident, and they, they monitored how... Jokes started to appear on the social networks when people re they were worried at first that they were all going to die because there wasn't any salt, and then they realised they were wrong and they started to make jokes about it, and that was watching something happen in a social network. So um, 
That's what you can get if you look at our observatory. So a couple more things, and I'm going to finish, because I want to drink as much as you do. Uh, here, that's the salt crisis again, and we're comparing Twitter and Wikipedia effects on... You know, you can look at that in the... I just want to point out one thing. Absolutely crucial here is that we, we have a, a common standard. And uh, Jim and um, his team at RPI have been working with, in schema.org to try and make sense of searching and, and cataloguing the data that you're all going to make available in the observatories. Um, this is a lovely slide from Jim that says, without schema.org, it's a mess. And with schema.org, you, you can actually see what's there. And then we can start, tell us about your data, or if you put it in the observatory, we promise we'll crawl it. So you, it, it's available to everybody through this mechanism. And um, you can, this is the, uh, the one they've got at RPI with their health data. We're all adopting this schema. Um, and I hope this is a meme that's going to spread. Um, and you can now take a picture of that if you want. This is the URL that went up today in the uh, schema.org proposals. We now have a, a web observatory schema available for anyone to use in the sense of the web. I'm two slides away from the end, Phil. No, four slides away, but they're all pictures. <laughs> so... We're at a bit of a crossroads. The web could go any which way. Tim's launched this, pro this idea, the web we want. Um, there's all sorts of challenges to what we've got, the thing we love and know and love. Um, and we need to understand, we need to advise our, our policy makers um, and the big we need to make sure the big companies aren't doing things they shouldn't do. We've had the Snowden affair and the personal data, um, the fallout from the Snowden affair, the NSA. We've got the whole issue of internet governance. I'm on a new global commission on internet governance. Tim's calling for a Magna Carta for the internet. And I think observing the web, we need to observe the web in order to protect and to develop the web we want. I think this is absolutely crucial for us going forward. I got these slides from Nosh this morning. This, um, and he's got the source from David Lazar. This is what um, the Hubble telescope cost. This is what CERN cost. But the web is priceless. And can we afford not to do this? It's so important to the world. Um, when people in a thousand years look back at how we've studied, how we've lived on the web, we need to be able to, you know, think of a thousand years. This is 20 years of what... Um, I got this slide from Les. This is why it's so important. This is, you might think, wonder what that is. Michael Jackson funeral or something. No, this is um, African migrants on the shore of the the city at night raising their phones in an attempt to capture an inexpensive signal from neighbouring Somalia in order to access the internet. That's the 70% who haven't got it yet. Can we afford to let it go before they've even experienced it? Um, so this is the ambition, people, to map the digital universe. That's what the web... And it's too important for you not to get involved. So please, please get involved. Thank you. It said, I had an hour, that's, that's an hour. I've been speaking for an hour. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, the reception is waiting for us, but let's make time for maybe a couple of quick questions if there are. For when you come, come forward to the mic, please. Heyman Purit uh, from Noesis Center, Wright State University. So many, first of all, thanks. Very wonderful, thought-provoking talk. Especially uh, the, the point about uh, web as a social machine. So I'm wondering about um, when we think of web as a social machine, we do need social scientists to work with computer sciences to gather to think of the social structures okay. which are emerging on the, uh, in such a new medium. Uh, the challenge comes in terms of modeling those social phenomena. Uh, because when we are trying to model computationally, we make assumptions, and then we get the results and insights out of those uh, uh, concepts. While the social, in social science, uh, science, 
uh, people are having those concepts at really abstract level. So when it comes to get to the modeling, uh, the differences come in if the two people are trying to work together, um, I mean, in the uh, isolated way and they're coming with results, if you're trying to put the results in one uh, structured form, there is sort of a problem in terms of interpreting them. So how can we deal with such a uh, problem as we go forward? Because this is very important. So my answer is the Web Observatory. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I will, I'll say one other thing. It's really hard to get funding for interdisciplinary research. And our social machines project is funded by our Engineering and Science Physical, Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, and it's really important that we, um, the people we're working with who are here, um, can, we can help them or they can get money from, uh, to, to be able to, as we produce the data, to do that type of modeling. Um, because it's absolutely crucial. We technologists can't, you know, we're not trained to do that, we can't do that. But I say also the answer to me is the web observatory because if people can get the data that we're producing, then anybody in the world can build whatever model they like on it and publish a paper about that. And, you know, I mean, this is why I want to take this concept to the social science conferences as well as talk about it here. Because we absolutely need, if we're going to produce this data, we need people who can use it and analyse it and, and build the models. And that's what I'm trying to do here. There's no easy answer. This is hard stuff. And believe me, I've co-supervised PhD students with our social scientists, and it's hard. And um, it's much easier to just write the code and, and you know... But... Um, <laughs> I really do believe, I believe passionately that if we don't do something like the observatory, we'll never get anywhere in this world because you can't just have one small group of people using your data. You really need to make it available to lots of different uh, groups to, to play with and uh, analyse in their own way. Does that make any sense? So my answer is the web observatory. Let's thank Wendy again. And uh, uh, as you exit this auditorium, take a ride to, to the room for...